extremely happy to be here at the opening of uh, this institute. I mean, this is just fantastic. Uh, I, I really couldn't agree more, and, and I'm very happy to uh, be here at the actual founding of it. And in fact, you might imagine that we coordinated the talk. Uh, actually, we did not at all. We just happened to agree exactly on everything. So, uh, but I, we can pretend we coordinated. And actually, it's better that we didn't. So, okay. So, so I'm going to talk today about uh, embedded optimization in smart systems and products. And I'll warn you, it's, it's not going to be technical, uh, but it'll give you some idea. And in fact, one of the overarching themes is exactly the theme from Maxima, which is that a lot of things that don't look related at first are actually related and the same methods are used uh, in them. So let's see, I should say that uh, uh, these are some of my uh, current and, and former students who helped me put these things together. And only at one little point, at one bullet, will we ever get to uh, the stuff I work on. Mostly it'll just be general uh, stuff that, uh, you know, if I say we, I mean me and a couple thousand of my colleagues across the world. So, okay. So, um, first let me, let me tell you about what you're in for. Um, so the style of the talk uh, is, uh, it's going to be no equations. Actually, there'll be one. You'll see. Because I, I can't have one with zero. That's not possible. But, uh, so, and it's going to be non-technical. Um, now, you might imagine that it'll be like super duper entertaining and there'll be videos and things like that. And I'm sorry to tell you, there won't be. Sorry. So, um, it, instead, it's going to be about ideas. Uh, so, uh, I'll just, I, so when you, I don't know, depending on, on what your background is, you'll, you'll probably go away with at least one idea or something like that. So, so it's, I'm sorry, but it's not going to be fun. And, uh, but it'll be, there'll be a lot of ideas here. Okay, so here's what, here's the outline. What I'll do first is I'll, I'll give you a rough idea of, you know, what do I mean by a smart system? Um, and then I'll say a little bit about the mathematical field that underpins them. That's uh, optimization. But I, when you're in the general public, you actually have to specify mathematical optimization, because optimization means something else, uh, something different. I'll tell you about that when we get to it. I'll, I'll then talk uh, about the idea of recourse, uh, which is simply doing something different when you, do, when you find new information. And then I'll wrap up. So that's, that's what we're going to talk about. <laughs> Let's just jump right in with what a smart system is. Well, a smart system is something that uses sophisticated mathematical algorithms. Uh, this runs on one or more computers or devices. This could run on a smartphone. It could be embedded in a processor in your car. Uh, it could be running at a data center, right? So any of these is, it could be any of these things. Uh, and typically it's going to involve lots of data. So these are, that's a smart system. And what they do is they'll make real-time decisions. Um, and actually, typically, without human intervention. I mean, usually, I mean, in many cases, there is a human sitting there somewhere with a big red button, which is the emergency stop button. So. That, that may be true, uh, but generally speaking, these are decisions made just without, without any human uh, intervention or anything like that. Okay, so let's look at some examples. The first one um, is uh, electrical power uh, generator dispatch. So in, this is how this works. Uh, I know how it works in California, and I imagine it works quite similarly here. Uh, so the way that works is every night between like midnight and 2 a.m., uh, what happens is, you schedule generators. In California, we have about 3,100 of them or something like that that are schedulable. And you schedule them uh, to, dis to meet uh, the predicted demand for the next day. Right? Schedule means you tell each one you should be generating 20 megawatts between 2 and 2.15 PM, and then keep it at 20 for a while, and then ramp it down to 15 or something like that. That's a schedule. And what you want to do there is minimize total costs because these have different costs of running. Uh, if you have a, a nuclear plant, uh, I mean, that, this cost is sunk, and so that has very low marginal cost. If you have something like a fast gas turbine or something like that, that would have a very high marginal cost. Um, well, you have to get the energy from where it's generated and where it's consumed, and you have to respect the limits on the transmission, uh, transmission line capacity. Actually, that's not quite true. Uh, you, if, you, if it's an emergency, you can overload one for 15 minutes or something, and they just get hot. So, okay. And uh, it will always include contingency plans for unplanned outages, right? So if, if one if a generator goes down, uh, you actually ahead plan for what you're going to do. And 
You want to be in a situation where you can where you can actually do something about that. Okay. Now, just to get a you know a picture of what this looks like, you know, here's the U.S. and here are various uh, uh, power plants. And the disk size shows you something like the annual uh, production. There's California, and then here's sort of a little detail of the transmission lines in California. Yeah, depending on you know what size you go down to, it's 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 a, maybe eight thousand or something. I mean. Big ones, it's maybe even just a couple of hundred. But if you go down to smaller ones, it's maybe, you know, it's, it's in the thousands or something like that. It's the, the so-called Western interconnection. Okay. This is what uh, this is what demand would look like. So this is the California Independent System Operator. They actually schedule uh, the generators in California. So the way that works is um, you actually go to a website, and here, uh, what, what you'll see is this, I don't know if you can see it, there's a little white dotted curve. And what that is, that's the prediction for next day's demand made the day before. And it was based on all sorts of stuff. It was based on history, it was based on weather predictions, because that drives a lot of it, things like that. Okay, so that's what this is. And then the red shows the actual realized demand, right? And you can see it's actually pretty good. Uh, that's like 22 gigawatts. And that's something like 40 or something. So you can see it's just a few percent off. Actually, we're going to talk about how you handle the fact that your prediction is not exactly right. We'll talk about that near the end of the talk. Okay? So this is the idea. And you can see it varies during the day, and you can explain all sorts of things here. This is everybody comes home and turns on lighting. Okay? So that's what that is. If, if it were the summertime, you might see a bump that would have to do with air conditioning and things like that. Okay. Second example. Um, and this goes, I think, to the, the theme, really, of the whole thing, is that these things, they look very different. Um, so here's the second one we're going to look at. Quantitative trading engine. So that's something like a hedge fund or something like that. Well, actually, uh, and this is done, done, of course, by computer and stuff like that. And the yeah. idea is that on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, which indeed can be second-by-second, -second, or indeed 10 millisecond-by-10 millisecond basis, or a day-by-day, -day, it doesn't matter. Um, what happens is, uh, an algorithm will determine the trades to make. And it'll, the goal will be to maximize the expected return. You certainly don't know what the return is, but you have some predictions of what it is, and you want to maximize the expected return. Uh, but you have to respect risk, leverage limits, and there might be some legal requirement. If you're a mutual fund in the US, you can't have short positions. Right? So these would be examples there. Um, and the idea is that you would, uh, this, is, this is sort of, yeah, that would be a smart system. Right. Nobody touches this. It just runs. Now there, there is. There's a big red button. Actually, what it really is is there's a handful of people with a little uh, beeper who have uh, very, very high security access, and they they can be beeped any time if something goes wrong. And there are the very few who can actually type in codes that will shut down a trading system or something like that. So, okay. So this is the kind of thing you want. Um, this is actually real. It's from one of my students. Uh, so everything's been. He wouldn't even tell me actually which fund it was. But uh, so here it is. This would be some. And this would be, this is some year where a okay. year has about 250 trading days. And this would be how some index went. And that'd be how the fund went. And you know this is this is what you want. That's, that's the page. And you don't win all the time, right? Like you know here's here's a drop. And in fact that's a bit embarrassing because the market's going up and you're dropping. But the point is on 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 balance you do pretty well. So this is the idea. Okay, span filter. Again, it, the stuff, this doesn't sound like the other two. I mean, with generator dispatch, you should be imagining, I don't know, giant turbines and, and uh, high voltage lines and dangerous stuff. Uh, I mean, with, with a trading, with trading computer, uh, that's different. You should imagine trading computers in, they're in New Jersey, by the way, or Connecticut. That's where, that's where they are. Actually, now they're in the middle of the country. So, St. Louis and places like that. Um, here, this is another one. It's, a safe, it's another smart system. It says that when an, in, an email comes in, and then what happens is you examine attributes of the message, right? So what that means is you will do things like find out where did it come from. Did it come from uh, Bulgaria? Word camps. So I don't know. It's twenty thousand words in English, you know, roughly something like that in a big dictionary, and you simply have a count of the number of times each word appeared. Um, of course, most of them would be zero, right? But it could be, you know, some other word, someone would appear. You know, then you'd have things, other, other attributes would be things like whether the sender is actually in your address, for example. And you'd combine this data with data from a lot of other users. In the case of Google, billions of other users, you would combine these things. And then what you're going to do 
is very quickly, I mean, not, this is not something where you think about it, but you know, in whatever, for half a second or something like that, you guess if that message is spam, and if it is, you flag it or you do something uh, stronger, like just move it to it, like delete it. Okay, so that's a, that's a spam code. Um, okay. Um, and here's give you an example. I mean, this is kind of, this is kind of obvious, uh, this is sort of an obvious spam, right? Uh, now, of course, <laughs> once it actually, I mean, things like the, the Gmail spam filter is, you know, infinitely more sophisticated. Th this is something that, uh, you know, it'd be very easy to put, put something together that would flag various things. Uh, things like sophisticated ones are way better. Uh, they, they can actually get amazing things. Okay. So I'll just list a bunch of other examples, and I'll say a little bit about them, right? And the theme is this. All of these things, they look very different, these applications. They all use the same mathematics. Actually, by the way, even the people who do these things, in many cases, don't know this. So because they speak this very local dialect, you know, you just work at a hedge fund. And that's, I mean, they would know a little bit. But I guarantee you, if I put somebody who does engine control together with someone from a hedge fund, they will have a lot of trouble communicating. Right? But the plain fact is, it's kind of all the same. So here it is. Um, engine control. So that's something like in your engine, this might be thousands of times a second. Measurements are made of temperatures, flow rates, predictions of power required and are, are guessed. And sm in small timing modifications are made to, fight, you know, to, the, to the, uh, the, the fuel injection, things like that. By the way, this is absolutely I mean, this is part of the reason that engines now are, uh, are, are how an engine could be basically like factor two or three cleaner than it would, would have been 25 years ago. This is absolutely critical. And this is universal now. All engines do this. All engines are run uh, with, with smart systems, making, me making measurements of various things, predicting things, and adjusting things, right? These are things, by the way, that used to be done in the 50s and 60s with little mechanical contraptions, right? Now it's done by very sophisticated control systems, okay? Um, well, essentially, that's hybrid vehicle engine management. So there, uh, that's, that's the question of how, if you have a hybrid vehicle, should you turn the engine off? And if it's on, what power should we generate at? And, you know, it's not as simple as you think. The goal is not always to have a full battery. You might imagine it is. That's completely wrong. Here's the thing. If you're in a, if you're in a hybrid vehicle, and you roll over the top of a hill, and you go down a big, long hill, the worst thing that can possibly happen is for your battery to be full. You know why? Because the whole point of a hybrid vehicle is that when you go down, down the hill, you use regenerative braking. And if your battery is full, you don't have anywhere to put the energy and you have to use your friction brake. And basically, it might as well be the 1960s again. Okay? So, so it's not obvious. By the way, the converse of that is if you are at the bottom of some hill or you need a burst of acceleration and your battery is empty, that's bad too. So all I'm saying is it's, you'd be that actually doing this intelligently uh, actually makes a huge difference. But, okay, recommendation engine. I mean, I think people know what that is. That's that you go to Netflix or Amazon, and it says, uh, oh, you know, people who, I don't know, depends, uh, you know, who've looked at things you've looked at, or who bought the things you bought, or watched the things you, or liked the things you like, might have liked this, and that that's a recommendation engine. And these are actually, they're getting shockingly good, and actually. To the point where it's spooky. We're going to talk about that later. Uh, beyond spooky, it's creepy. We'll, we'll get to that. Uh, so, um, search engine, that's another one, right? So, that's a very smart system uh, because, in fact, it's not what you think it is, right? It's not, I mean, the simple idea of a search system is you type in some string and then you want to return something relevant. Actually, no, what you really want, here's, here's the real goal of a, of a search engine. The real goal of a search engine is that what's, whatever anybody types in, they click on either the first, second, or third thing you, you put up there. That's the real goal. Everybody got that? So that's, and it may, I mean, of course, relevance will maybe make them click on the first. But that's, and in fact, what happens is if you're something like Google or any of these, you're, you're learning from data, and you get like 10 billion data points every day. Because people type in search things, you just, you guess in 40 milliseconds, what would be the most relevant things? You put them up there. If they go to the second page and click on number 15, that's, that's basically bad, right? By the way, if they say screw it and type in something different or they go to another page, that's really bad, right? And it's learning. These things are learning the whole time. Statistical models. Online advertising. That is entirely wrong now. 
entirely run by smart systems, right? So this is when you go, if you're a publisher, you have a website, somebody comes to the website, and you have to decide what ad to show, right? So you, the old days when, you know, it was some guy named Bob or something who's been doing this for 20 years and had some idea that in the fall you should show these things in this time slot, that's gone. Or actually, the truth is anybody who runs a smart system hopes their competition is using Bob. <laughs> That's, that's actually, that's, that's, that you hope that that's what you're up against, right? And now it's not done that. Incredibly sophisticated statistical models are made of people, what, you know, what they'll click on, things like that, all that sort of stuff. That's time varying, and, and, you know, so we'll look at that. Flight management system. Well now, I mean, and this has been true for a while now, but the fact is that planes can basically fly from one, from one runway to another, right? So in the U.S. they're required. I think one in five landings has to be manual or something like that. Uh, just because otherwise the pilots will forget how to land or something like that. So there, is some, there are some rules like that. Um, but these things are unbelievably sophisticated, right? They'll, they'll track winds that are going. They'll trade off you know, fuel efficiency with all sorts of other stuff. By the way, even just the small things like executing a turn, you type into a flight management system a waypoint, you sail into a waypoint, and it will execute a flawless turn. Uh, you won't even, the plane won't even, if it's not windy, you won't even drop a meter or two. No human being can actually execute a turn like that. I mean, it doesn't matter, right? But, uh, I mean, these things are coordinating everything. All control surfaces, thrust on engines, and things like that. Okay? So, um, another example would be automated real-time fraud detection. So, credit card transactions, this is done absolutely universally. Right? Every credit card transaction, when it's authorized, it goes to some computer. It looks there, and it actually might even do a multi-way classification. They would actually look at it. This is just all some big, some algorithm, mathematical algorithm running on some giant data center. And we'll look at it, and it'll even say something like, that's okay. Or it might say, that's not right. And then it, will, it might even just stop it right there. Or it might be something in the middle, in which case that transaction is routed to a bunch of people who are trained. And we'll actually look at it, and then two seconds later, maybe half the time, they'll say, that's okay. You know, or it might say, that doesn't look right, and flag it. So these things are running. Supply chain system. Um, this is basically you know, how a company will route, uh, will control the manufacture and the shipping of its products. So these things are incredibly sophisticated now. Again, once again, it is not you know, Bob in the back room saying, yeah, you know, the spring these swimsuits, we sell a bunch of them. Let's order some. It is not that anymore, I trust me. Okay. It's very sophisticated. Um, Amazon, for example, I can assure you of this, is right now shipping product to Melbourne. I got the city right there, not uh, Melbourne. And it's not based on any orders. No orders. It's based on sophisticated predictions of how many people, maybe you, will order things tomorrow. Okay? I promise you, these are on airplanes now. They're coming into Melbourne, right? And so, I mean, these things are just crazy. I mean, this is crazy stuff. So, but this, what does this do? It will take the time. I mean, it, you actually place an order, and then it actually had to start where it started. It started, I guess, it shouldn't have been right. Go out, who knows where it'll go, where it'll go from there, but it'll take a long time. So this stuff is just, and no one is aware of it, just all the time. The last one I'll talk about is revenue management. So actually, anyone know what this is? Right. You're gonna learn something. Ready? This is this is a hideous euphemism for uh, a, a practice. It's basically how does a company extract as much money as possible from you? <coughs> That's what it is. It's a highly developed field, by the way. Actually, I am uh, embarrassed to report that Stanford played a big role in this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, no, but not me. I'm, I'm innocent, but um, my colleagues aren't actually. Um, <laughs> And so this is the idea, you know, you fly on an airplane, and what you do is like have these super expensive seats. Because your fantasy, if you're if you're if you run an airline, your fantasy is some business person says, oh dear, I have to be in Sydney tomorrow. At which point you go, oh, <laughs> well we have a seat, but it's really expensive. Okay? So this is this is exactly what you want. Now if you hold that seat too long, it'll go empty. And then you've lost everything, right? So if you give it up, if you sell it to somebody for cheaper earlier, then, uh, and then the business person comes along and says, I have to be in Sydney tomorrow, then you're like, I could, anyway, so 
that, uh, it, it's pretty, it's, it's very effective, by the way. It's very good for companies. Okay, so. So these are just some of the examples. Uh, and you know, these are all, all of these are like actually whole industries, right? And my point is that they actually fit, well, they fit the maximum model, uh, perfect. Uh, they all use some of the same mathematics, right? I mean, maybe, you know, it's not always, it's not ex certainly not exactly the same, but it's very close. And that's what we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk about how do these things work? I'm not going to go into the details, of course. But I'll tell you a little bit about you know, how they work. Um, you know, at a high level. And we'll talk about things like entirely similar. What methods do they use? I mean, I don't know. How do they fail? That's very interesting. Because these things can fail spectacularly. And we'll talk about that. And then we'll even talk a little bit about where, where is it going. Um, so, this brings us to the actual topic. Optimization. So, okay, so, and you have to specify mathematical optimization. Because uh, if you just say optimization actually out in the real world, it, normally it means search engine optimization. There's such a big business in that. So, mathematical optimization. The idea is to use mathematics, computers, you know, to make good decisions and choices, right? So, and this is just a wonderful tagline. Uh, I don't know who came up with this, but where, wherever they are, they are genius. I mean, it's just, it's very good. So, it's called Science of Better. Um, that's pretty, that's actually almost too good, right? <laughs> All right, so the history is very old, right? So this is basically, I mean, in some sense, this is kind of what calculus is about, right? So this goes back to like Newton, you know, Gauss and calculus, and, and there's our one equation, which I have no intention of explaining. But if you have been a victim of <laughs> calculus, or have actually been a perpetrator of, I mean, victimized other people with calculus, then, you know, these are the, this is kind of the idea, these are the images, you know, you see something smooth and, oh, there's the minimum down there and so on. Okay, fine, right? I mean, actually, the point about this, this kind of older style stuff is, and maybe this will bring back bad memories, but the point is that, guess what? No one is ever going to come up to you and say, here's a rope that's 100 meters long, you know, please place it in such a way that it encloses as much land as possible. I mean, guess what? These things don't happen, okay? So, all right. But we'll talk about we'll, we'll, we'll go into these. All right. So there's a new style of optimization, right? So, um, but the new style, it embraces, it embraces you know, algorithmic approach, right? You're not after like little formulas and things like that and pencil and paper things. It's not, it's not about that. Um, it accepts from the beginning there's going to be com computation involved, right? So it's not about finding formulas. And this is maybe where there's a deviation from uh, people trained in classical mathematics, right? But the idea is you're going to use the fact that you can fire up 10,000 processors. It, by the way, any of you here can do this. This is all completely commoditized, right? So you can do this on Amazon, for example. You can, you can set up an account, type in your Visa card, and if you want, in five minutes, you can have 100,000 computers working for you. I mean, you'll, the taxi meter will be running, so you better have something good to do with it, but the point is anybody can do this now. Um, and it's also, it's, gonna, it's, it's not going to shy away from the fact that there's lots of data. Okay. Now, this new style, I think you trace it back to, well, I would say von Neumann, uh, George Danzig, who, you know, popularized you know, linear programming. And so, you know, these are some pictures if you want to associate it with it. That's something like a data center. In fact, that's a hideously old data center. We don't look like that anymore. But, you know, it serves the purpose. Um, and then that's just a snippet of code. So, you know, it's, it's sort of, this is the picture you would have with this new style of optimization, as opposed to the 19th century classical optimization. Okay, so let's talk about optimization. In fact, I'll tell you pretty much what it is. So here's the taxonomy. You need some things you need to choose. These are called variables, sometimes called decision variables, right? That means these are the things you have to choose, right? Should you purchase these shares, and if so, how many? Uh, should I adjust the, the thrust on the left inboard engine? By the way, these, these are questions being asked every 20 milliseconds, I might add, right? And if so, or maybe I should leave it alone. These are the types of questions you're asking, right? Um, well, you have to have a list of things you care about, and they have to depend on the choice. I mean, you may have things you care about that don't depend on the choice, but then they're not part of this, right? So, and you need a model that tells you how your choices affect the things you care about. And then you have to have a description of your preferences among the choices. So this is really, that's the taxonomy of, of optimization. So let's, let's look how that actually works in some specific cases. Well, in generators, the variables might be the generator powers, right? We might have 30 generators, and 
the variables would be, should that generator be on? And if so, what power should it generate? Hey, the truth is it's really a schedule, like how, how much should it generate during the day? Okay, we have to respect the limits. The generator only goes up to, you know, 20 megawatts. You can't ask it to put out 25. But you can ask, but it's not going to happen. So, okay, you can't overload transmission lines. We already talked about that. You can, actually, if you're in a pinch. Um, you have to meet the required demand. Actually, sometimes that doesn't happen, right? So, um, uh, you want to minimize your total, you, you care about things like the total cost of generation, and you might care about CO2 emissions. Um, now, the model is going to describe a couple of things, right? It's how power flows in the network. We know how power flows in the network. The signal to noise ratio just went up because the AC, the air conditioning was shut off. So, I, if you like, I can even back down a little bit. But I didn't get any complaints in the back so far. The, Maybe it's because they don't hear me at all. <laughs> no, no. Okay, I got a visual indication. Uh, okay, fine. Right, there's two. If you don't get complaints, there's two plus. Anyway. Okay. Um, okay. So the model tells you how the power flows in the, in the, in the network and, and uh, what would be the cost of generation. Okay. So how, when you describe preferences, this is done many, many different ways, right? Uh, and so the idea would be something like this. There are people usually talking about hard constraints. That means that some choices are just like unacceptable, you know, unex completely unacceptable, right? So an example is asking a generator to generate more than it can. That's just, it's just not gonna happen. Uh, uh, telling, uh, let's see, I mean, these are examples. If you're a hedge fund, or not a hedge fund, sorry, but if you're a, uh, a mutual fund, and in fact, you, you're asked to hold a short position, which is to hold a negative number of shares, that's illegal. Anyway, so that's, let's, let's treat that as a hard constraint. Right. So, um, and then there's an objective function. And this kind of measures desirability. And there's two different ways to do this. And actually what's interesting anthropologically is each field adopts one or the other. And it's kind of weird. So economists, for example, uh, maximize utility functions. And sometimes it's, they call it utility. I mean, that's obviously a good thing. But it could be something more specific, like maximize the profit. Right? Um, it, other people, uh, for example, a lot of people in engineering, minimize costs, right? So it, you could minimize cost or power or risk or these kinds of things, right? And so, of course, these are completely equivalent because you just, if you minimize one thing, you, it's the same as maximizing, say, it's negative, for example. And so it's, it doesn't really matter, although you will see people talking about both of these things. Um, there's other ways to do this. You can talk about trade-offs among different things that you care about. Right, so you can have risk and return, for example. Um, so we'll look at uh, we'll look at some quick examples. In generator dispatch, your constraints might be: you have to respect generator limits, you can't overload transmission lines, you have to you have to meet demand. Okay. Once these things are satisfied, then you get down to okay, these things are satisfied. When would I like one more than another? And you, well, if, if one costs less, that would be great. If it costs the same amount but generates less carbon dioxide, fantastic. I mean, this would be an example of how you might describe this. And you might have a, a picture like this, right? It shows that in some situation, you, you can actually train off stuff. You can actually uh, generate electricity more cheaply, but it's gonna be dirty, right? Or, or this is sort of the idea. Where you operate on here, that's another choice, right? The, the, but this is, the point here is you get a trade off between the two. Okay, in a training engine, well, the variables would be the shares of each asset that you buy and sell, right? By the way, that could be zero. You could just hold. That's an option, right? So it could be zero. Um, the constraints could be legally imposed. They could be, uh, well, there'd be legal limits on leverage and things like that. They could be broker requirements, things like that. Um, and the objectives might be that you would really like to minimize your risk, right? You'd have some model of how much are you at risk. And then another model, by the way, would tell you how much do you expect to make. Uh, that's an average, and you'd want to maximize that. And then you'd have a model that would that would actually try to predict these depending on your holdings and things like that. Right? So I mean, some of these things would be completely obvious, right? If you held, if all of your portfolio were held in very low risk, you know, bonds or something, and you're not going to make much, but uh, your risk is going to be low. And if you put all of it into uh, with high leverage into very volatile things, it's the opposite. Okay, and you might get a very classical trade-off curve. Uh, this one is real. Uh, uh, risk, 
uh, versus uh, mean return. And so you could have something that's approximately zero risk. By the way, this is normally taken to be uh, US Treasury bills. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's at zero right now. Uh, but um, all right. So, but it's usually taken as defined to be the zero. Uh, that didn't take into account Republicans, of course. So, um, but yeah, this, this is what it would look like in an ideal world. So, um, all right, so that's the idea. And you could also have something that was very risky, has a very high return, but a, a big variation. All right, expand them. The variables here are variable, these are just the parameters in a statistical model. Right? No, by the way, notice that these other examples, the variables were associated with actions, right? Like you buy shares or you sell them, or in an airplane engine, you would crank the thrust up, or you'd push the left elevator down, you know, or I'm sorry, the uh, left uh, aileron, you know, down another 0.1 degrees or something. These are actions. Actually, in a spam filter, there's no actions associated with the choices. What they are is they're parameters in a statistical model. And here's what you want you want to minimize the false positive rate, sure, and you want to minimize the false negative rate. Positive, false positive rate is basically when uh, the spam filter says that's spam, but it's not, right? And false negative is the opposite. It says that's not spam, but it is, right? And both of these are bad occurrences. And then you have a, a model, a statistical model that predicts how these depend on your choices, right? And there'll be a trade-off. And the trade-off might look something like this, and this one actually is real. I mean, not that it matters, but this would be real. So this would be for a particular uh, classifier. And it says that you could operate anywhere on this curve. Uh, it says, for example, suppose maybe false, false positive is pretty bad because that's a real email message and it went into some spam folder or something. And this is the, the that would be the, that's the false uh, negative, sorry. Um, and, sorry, false positive. And so you might operate somewhere like here, right? And that says that you can have a 0.1% false positive rate, but you have a, a, a 1.4% false negative rate or something like that. So this, this is the idea. Okay. So now, it's time to do some optimization. So we're actually going to do something. Okay. So, and I'm actually going to make a point. At this point, I'm going to make. So let's do something. Um, so we want to schedule 200 megawatt hours of demand, minimizing the total cost. And here's what we got. We have four generators. The first one will generate up to 110 megawatts at $37 per megawatt hour. Okay. And the second one, 80 up to 80 at this price. And these are sorted uh, in inverse price. And in fact, people call this uh, a bid stack, right? That's a bid, right? They're saying, I will generate up to that amount at this price. And then when you sort them by price, that's called the bid stack, OK? So, OK. Mm, we need someone to, uh, we need someone to, what do we do? What should we do? What do you think? One. Generator one? Good, fine. So how much generator one should we use? 50, 60? All, all, all of it, thank you. All of it. Okay, are we done? No. Because we're going for 200. Keep going. Alright, so we go all generator one, all generator two, and a little bit of generator three, just enough to bring us to 200. Okay? So that's okay. So guess what? Oh by the way, you've just done optimization. <laughs> just just so you know. Did you did you like it? Okay, all right. So, well, I'm going to make a point. Don't worry, I'm going to make a point. But you just, you just did it. That's optimization. And actually, yeah, yeah, of course you start going to use bids and you work your way up. So guess what? It turns out, actually, quite a lot of optimization problems are totally obvious and stupid. I mean, they're just like, okay, duh, this is what you do. So it's just common sense, easily solved by a person, right? So, and by the way, the answer a little, to solve a little problem like this I need to tell you what you don't need. You don't need any mathematics, right? You don't need a data center, right? And I don't need like sophisticated algorithms or something like that. Okay. Um, but actually, even if most optimization problems that come up look like this, it uh, turns out it takes very little to put it beyond what a human being can do. Okay. So all you need to do is this. Here's an example. All we do is we put this in a network. There are the generators. There, there's our four generators. And then demand at 200 megawatts, that's actually concentrated at these red squares. And these are all transmission lines, and they all have capacities. And you can't violate them. Okay? So actually, for something this simple, which is 
well, it's a very small problem as far as a computer is concerned. I promise you, no human being can come even close. It's just too complicated for a person to handle. You just can't do it. I mean, you can start arguing and stuff and say, that's the cheapest, so I'll wrap a lot of the energy this way because I know, that, I know these are you know, energy me Blabber on and on and all this kind of stuff. It won't matter. Uh, you won't get it. You won't get this. Uh, but it, it is something like this. A computer can solve in about 15 microseconds. Okay? So, and it would be exactly right. It could solve a problem like this with a couple thousand generators and 10,000 lines, and it could do that in a few seconds. Okay? And it, it goes without saying, a human being is way, way out of the running of that one. Okay? So this is, this is the idea. Um, and so, you know, the answer might look something like this. That's the cheapest one. Of course you want to use it. You can't use all of it. And you can't use it because you can't deliver the power. People would say that there's congestion on the lines, right? Because this thing, it, it's, it'll generate cheap power. You can't use all of it because you can't get it from where it's generated to where it's consumed. Okay? And this would be sort of the, the, the picture you'd see. Okay. So now let's talk about where do models come from? Right? In all of this, there's some mathematical model that says, if you do this, this is what I think is going to happen. Okay, so that's the model. And these things come from the most obvious ones. You know, basically, they come from like Newton. It's physics, first principles, right? So for generator dispatch, they come from physics, right? We know, uh, we know how power flows on networks. We know how, I mean, we know that very well. Uh, the models are good to a percent, less than a percent, maybe. I mean, they, maybe not much less. Uh, but something like that, that's, so that's, that's great. But for spam, I mean, come on. Uh, here, you know, there's physics, right? There's a, there's a fundamental theory of how electricity flows on networks. We know how it does that. There's no fundamental theory of spam, and there's not going to be. <laughs> spam comes from, you know, Bulgaria. And it uses, <laughs> it, I mean, it's associated. <laughs> That's, and then it, it uses, by the way, it uses Microsoft, then it uses your computers because they've been taken over. Uh, so, and it uses your Microsoft computers, those of you who use them, uh, to forward it. That's what spam is. You know, now these, the models that are actually used, the statistical models, are these, you know, I mean, they're, they're kind of hilarious. They're, they're things like, oh, you know, uh, spam and its, and its attributes are red, uh, samples from a random distribution and stuff. This is not, this is not the case, right? Okay. Now the other way is data fitting. These are black uh, gray box models. Um, and the idea here is you guess a form for the model characterized by some parameters. And then what you do is you fit the parameters to observe data. And what's hilarious is you don't even fit parameters, use optimization. So this is really, this is starting to sound super duper circular, right? Because if you say, when I go to a web page and some ads are shown, you say, how, are, how is the choice of ads determined? And the answer is, Optimization, so mathematical optimization algorithm. How did it decide? They had a model of what things you might click on or be interested in. Where did that model come from? It came from looking at zillions of other people who were shown ads, and then how did you get the model parameters? Optimization. Is everybody following this? Actually, it even gives me a little bit of a headache, but um, but this is in fact the way it works. Okay. So the idea that there's different models used by different you know different fields. And they're quite different, and actually, it's a, uh, it's a source of a lot of tension and confusion. And what's very bad is when you have someone from one field goes into another and thinks that the world is more like where they came from and all that, and everything's the same or something like that. I mean, for example, a physicist who's used to models that, well, yeah, they're, I mean, they're really good, and then they go to Wall Street and they're not. Uh, so, okay, <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Um, okay, so, and then you typically in that case use different model styles. Um, and this is why not only can a lot of people who work on these things, you know, they're really doing the same thing, not only can they not talk to each other because they don't speak the same language, it turns out once they do speak kind of a pigeon that goes in between them, it turns out they don't, they don't want to talk to each other because they have totally different views of the world. So, okay, so first principle models, right? This is, you know, if you want a picture, it's like Newtonian mechanics, okay? That's what it is. Yeah, we know how spacecraft fly, I mean, mostly, right? Uh, actually, pretty much completely, right? Um, we know how electricity flows on wires, right? And these are expressed as equations, you know, and they can be assembled from their components, right? 
so this is, I mean, this is basically what started at Newton and ended, uh, you know, with uh, the calculus that we torture students with and the physics one and things like that. I mean, that's, it's been phenomenally successful, so I'm not making, well, I am making fun of it, but we, we should remember this has been phenomenally successful. Okay. Data fitting, fitting a model. That, I mean, the right picture of that is something like this, which again, you may or may not have seen if you were, uh, again, tortured in a calculus class, um, except this one was actually useful, just for the record, for those of you who were tortured in calculus class, just for the record, integrating like t squared sine t, that's totally useless. No, this was useful. <laughs> Finally, I got the rise out of the audience. Okay, I heard that. Okay, so, all right, this is useful. And the picture is, you know, you have a bunch of data and you want, now how many, how many parameters are in this model? Two, right? There's the offset and the slope. Okay? So this is, this is great. I mean, you know, it's like regression, that's fine. Now, in real applications, the number of, it looks just like this, except that the number of parameters is not two. It's hundreds at a minimum. It could be thousands, it could be millions, and in fact, it could be a billion. Okay? So spam filters use up to a billion. Attributes. Now, by the way, most of them are zero, right? But the fact is, it has, it, the model has, at, it, it can use, potentially, a billion parameters, okay? So, um, and this is the key, data fitting, that's the key to using optimization in an application when you have a non-existent, or like a completely dubious first principle model, right? So, like a spam filter, like fraud. There is no mathematical theory of fraud. That's ridiculous, right? That's not the way it works. Right? People steal, they skim credit card numbers, they're sold in blocks, you know, on, on, on dark websites or whatever, and then people use, build the cards and use them. That's what it really is, okay? There is no mathematical theory of it, there's not going to be. What there are, are superb data fit statistical models. That's what there are, right? Uh, by the way, of course they're not perfect, right? But they're way better than you would imagine. Okay, so let's talk about a little bit more about some of the pitfalls and complications in optimism. So now I'm going to tell you about, like, basically when do things mess up and how do they mess up? What are the you know, how, it, how do these things fail? So the first is, you know, a lot of people hear about this and they go, oh, that's fantastic. In fact, it's usual for students learning about this to realize they walk around, they, they emerge from a class and they go like, oh my god, everything is optimization. It's unbelievable <laughs> that they walk around. I can recognize students like this. They, they walk in a certain way, but they're floating around. <laughs> And then I tell them, look, you know what? Uh, the question is, you know, can you solve it? Yeah, and by the way, it's good exercise to formulate things on optimization problem because it basically says you have to articulate what you want. You have to say what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. You have to say what are the things you're going to mess with. So I guess you might call it it's thinking in the box, right? So, and I'm a huge fan of thinking in the box. So, uh, yeah, you say what you say what is allowed, what's not allowed. You say, what would a good solution look like? What would make you happy? What would not make you know, this kind of thing? Okay. So uh, we'll get to that. Actually, I'll give you the punchline right now. So you can set up all sorts of optimization problems, and you can't solve any of them. So, sorry. We'll get to that. Another pitfall is things you just forgot to specify and bad models. That's very scary. So we'll, we'll talk about some of these things. So the thing is, you formulate an optimization problem. Can you solve it? And you know, unfortunately, the answer is often no. So it's only some problems that can be solved. Um, by the way, it is completely different from the problems that were solved in your calculus book, right? Those were silly things from the mid-19th century, you know, with the rope and enclosing the most area and all that kind of stuff. That doesn't come up anywhere, okay? And it's, it's, it's just not used. So all that 19th century stuff, I mean, there's about 15 problems you can solve, and that's pretty much it, right? So. Um, but there are other ones, and it turns out there's actually something very cool here. It turns out that they're really simple. By the way, now we're getting close to my research, but I promise I'm only going to spend like about 20 seconds on it. But it is kind of cool, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. So here it is. It turns out simple looking problems can be super hard. I can write down an innocent little problem, has only like 10 variables to choose. The model itself can be very simple, smooth. I can write formulas for it, and you'd say, well, that's, that's from, I know that from, that's what my, that's the one thing my calculus class did teach me. I take the partial derivative and set it to zero. Anyway, doesn't matter, you can't do it. Okay, so simple problems can be super hard. In fact, 
And then here's the really cool part. It turns out that some really difficult looking problems can be solved really well. And that's the kind of thing I do. I mean, it's not just me. It's me and, I don't know, you know a couple thousand other people. Um, but so for example, it's not at all uncommon in these statistical models, other models, for people to solve problems with a billion variables. Google does it every night. So they, they collect an absolutely immense amount of data, giant farms, you know, a lot of water downstream heats up, and they're solving gigantic problems so that they can better guess like what, what websites uh, or, or what ads you're going to click on or what you're actually looking for when you type in a search query. Okay? So, um, and it's fun. I mean, you need training to recognize these in hard problems, and that's, that's why it's actually fun. Okay, enough on that. Let's move on. Um, so here's a big pitfall. This is very typical. It turns out, you know, in optimization, what's kind of cool about it is you have to explicitly say what you want. Okay? Or another way to say that is, these, uh, uh, some mathematical solver, it has no common sense. I mean, it just, it, it doesn't, it, it'll do exactly what you tell it to do. Um, and you have absolutely no right to complain about what it does if it's something you didn't specify. So here's what you can do. You can not solve an optimization problem to do a generator schedule and then say, have you know, Bob look at it and say, no, no, there's no way. Are you kidding? This, is, this, way, this relies way too much on you know, unit two of this generator. That's impossible, right? You can't have uh, some portfolio manager look at it and say, no, 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 that's not diversified enough. You know what, if that's not diversified enough, then you should have put that in the constraints or in the objective. That's the way it is, right? So, all right, and the last one. And this is something, I mean, all of these are kind of common sense. The first one, the, this is actually very important. So a model is never exactly right. They can be really close, like Newtonian mechanics, or all of circuit design. All of it is done in simulation first, right? So, like my iPhone, I don't know where it is, somewhere around here. All of the circuits in it were designed first. They were never, it's not like it's not the old days where you know you build something in a garage and you stick a voltmeter on it. It doesn't work that way, right? Everything is designed and simulated and optimized and things like that, right? So those models are pretty good, right? So that when you send off some gigantic design to you know uh, to Taiwan on or something like that, and then it's going to come back six months later. These are fantastically complicated things. These are billions of parts in them. They actually, most of the time, they work, which is actually kind of amazing if you think about it, right? And that's only possible because the models we have, and the models basically say, if this is the physical design, will it actually work? And the, the models are actually pretty good. They're accurate to like two, three significant figures, right? So that's at one extreme. And you'd have to say like, Economics is at the other, right? So something like that. Or, well, I mean, actually, I was talking to people who run hedge funds, and they said, uh, you know, they said, no, we, we get, uh, no, I mean, it would be incredible if they got one significant figure. One guy said, very simple, we're happy when we get the sign right. <laughs> and then, the people were, and then he said, he said, yeah, but then he said the following, he said, and you know what? We only have to do that 51% of the time. <laughs> so, uh, so you know, I'm just saying, these are, these are very different extremes, right, in models. Uh, okay. So, a model I mean, always ignores effects, terms, or exogenous factors, and they can change with time. Uh, generally not Newtonian mechanics, right, but, uh, or power flow. I mean, unless it's something you didn't model, like, uh, you know, a failure in power line, although, in fact, you've modeled it. Something like that. But for these more dubious models, statistical models, they could easily change with time. Okay. Now, if you're lucky when things change, everything's fine. That, that's the good outcome, right? Now, if not, <clears throat> uh, things can get bad. So, here's a portfolio. We've optimized it, right? So, we've carefully selected among 10,000 assets and we've got some portfolio going and this is it. And then, this is what happens if we believe our normal return model. We simulate the portfolio before we do anything, by the way. And you get something that looks like this. It looks pretty good. The probability, that's a loss right there. You know, there's not much, not enough probability down here. The probability of a loss looks like basically zero. It looks like you're going to get, I don't know, you know, six, seven percent, you know, with a good, and you would be lucky and be up here, that's a bad day. Okay. Now, your model, of course, isn't quite right. And it's, I mean, this looks great, but it could be. Let's suppose you put in, suppose the model is not right, it's a little bit wrong. And so in fact, instead of this blue curve, which again is this green thing, 
And this is kind of what you'd expect. And you'd say, well, look, my mom predicted I almost never lost. The truth is, I do lose 2-3% of the time. And in fact, I'm not, I shouldn't be expecting to get 5 or 6%. I should really be targeting 4.5. This is reasonable. This is actually what you, kind of what you want, right? Because you, you don't expect it to be perfect, right? But it, it might have looked like this. <laughs> and that's very bad, right? But by the way, this happens frequently in fields, in many applied fields. So what happens is some young people come in and they go, oh, you know, you guys don't know what you're doing. Uh, we'll, we'll use optimization for it. And they go, okay, or whatever. And anyway, so and what happens is they, they come over and say, what are you doing? And you go, step back, it's mathematics. Okay, we need to <laughs> stay back a little bit, you know. And so they do it. Anyway, and what happens is, of course, then they, they fire it up. And, and so this is just a complete disaster. So you thought you've optimized this portfolio to minimize your risk and almost have no possibility of losing and blah, blah, blah. And it turns out what you've just done is something absolutely disastrous. Um, you know, you're with 90% probability going to lose money and, in fact, sometimes quite a lot. Okay? So this happens. Oh, by the way, when this happens, then they pick out the young kids. Uh, and in that field, optimization has a bad name for like 10, 15 years. So. But by the way, they come back again. Not the same kids, by the way, different ones. Come back 10 years later, and then they get it right. So but it doesn't matter. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of harm happens before that, but anyway. OK. All right. So if your models are or become wrong, then the results are useless. Right. Or much worse. I mean, so this, this uh, as in long-term capital management, there was a hedge fund in the 90s that went down. It basically kind of took the world economy with it. Right. And that was just from bad model. That was, that, that was people believing in their models. Yes, it turns out they were physicists. I know some of you were asking that question. They were physicists. And, and yes, they, they believed the models. And the models said, well, some, that could never happen. Well, guess what? That did. Oh, by the way, they, never, they didn't say that couldn't happen. What they said was, Oh, the probability that happened is, you know, one chance in, you know, 20 trillion. Well, guess what? It happened. Okay? And it took, basically, first it took them out, and then it proceeded to take pretty much the world economy out. Okay. So, all right. So, by the way, just to reassure you, now that you're nervous, um, good practitioners, they always check sensitivity to assumptions, right? Always, right? So, if you come up to me and you say, oh, I've got a great way to control an airplane, then I'll try it on an airplane model, but I'll also go back and I'll fiddle with the model parameters and make sure it works. I'll make sure it works if there's some weird, you know, wind gust, you know, from the left or something like that. I mean, people do all of this kind of stress testing. Okay? And there's even ways to build the, the making it less sensitive into the optimization. I won't talk about that. Okay. But here's a picture. And I mean, I could have done this very dramatically, by the way, and I could have just shown you, this is also real, uh, also from one of my students from the hedge fund here who wouldn't uh, divulge what it was from. But it, so I could have very dramatically shown you this. Now, had I shown you this data here, and then said, and then said, oh, I have a statistical model of that. I have a, I can, you know, I mean, I can't predict exactly, but I, I, I know what looks kind of normal and stuff like that. You would have said, sure, yeah, there's plenty of evidence, right? Um, and so this, but this, this is actually like real data in this shot. Like, I mean, and, so the point is, this, is, by the way, was, what started as long-term capital management failure and then went spread throughout the whole financial system. Um, this picture is the worst, for people who do this kind of stuff, this is your worst nightmare, this picture. In fact, I'm going to quickly move on because it's make, actually making me nervous. But they've done, they've done test people who do this. This, when you wake up sweating at 2 in the morning, this is the picture in your mind. Right? <laughs> By the way, this is why you have the guy with the big red, the red button, or really the little beeper that allows you to authenticate and, and uh, do huge things with just a couple of keystrokes, right? So this is that. OK. Um, the last topic I'm going to talk about, and briefly, is going to be um, recourse. Right? So, so far, I've talked about optimization. Right? So this means you have some things to choose. There's a model of how it affects things. And what we're going to talk about is recourse. Recourse means basically just new information comes in, and you can act again. And actually, a lot of things have that flavor. Um, so the basic idea is you don't just commit to some, act, some choices and actions once. You do this actually multiple times, right? So uh, that's clear. For a lot of the applications we're talking about, this is clear. Uh, even for uh, pretty much for almost, almost all of them. Oh, circuit design, it isn't, right? You commit to those, you commit to that design and you 
ship it off to Taiwan. And it's true you can go back and fix it again, but if, if it doesn't work the first time, this is a total disaster because you'll miss the market and all that kind of stuff, right? So, uh, but other than that, a lot of these things do have recourse built into them, right? It's got lots of names. One's dynamic optimization. Optimization, that's kind of obvious, multi-stage. But there's a whole field called automatic feedback control. And in fact, people doing it, well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, there is a tradition, but a lot of people doing it would not say that they do optimization. They would say that I do, I do control, right? And that's, but it's basically making good choices Repeated, like every 20 milliseconds in your engine or something like that. Um, and in AI, they would call something like that an intelligent agent. So, so it's got lots of names. Um, and the idea is it exploits new information and it corrects for model errors, right? Um, so that's, that's the idea. I mean, in some ways, it's, it's fairly obvious. Um, and look, some example, from our examples, here are some, here are some ideas there. Uh, generator dispatch, you saw the predictions are not perfect. So you don't just predict, you don't predict what tomorrow's demand is at 2 a.m. and send a dispatch to the generators. I mean, you could, and by the way, you'll be pretty close. You'll be within 1%, okay? But 1% is not good enough, right? So you have to be dead on. And so the way that works is that every hour, or every 15 minutes, you'll actually re-predict and make small changes to what, what, in fact, each generator should be generating. Right? I mean, by the way, some of them won't change at all. They'll be like base loads, they'll just, they won't change at all. And the little fast gas turbines, they'll be ramping up and down to follow low. Okay. And a training engine, well, except for a buy and hold strategy, the whole point is that you do this recursively, that you sit there, you, you, you hold some things. By the way, then the value, your portfolio will drift, right? You might start off with something that has low risk, but a little bit has been put in some high risk stuff and suppose it does really well. And now a lot of your portfolio is held in high risk. Guess what? You now hold a high risk portfolio and so you trade back and things like that. You balance things, so you'd rebalance. Okay, um, and a spam filter, well it's on a smaller scale, but you would, you would adapt to user feedback. So basically when somebody in Bulgaria, you know, creates a new get ready to send out some more spam. Actually it also comes from Florida, by the way. Anyway, so, Someone there, and then he sends out a message to all of your Windows computers, if you use Windows, which faithfully forward them. Uh, then what will happen is, you know, all of a sudden a bunch of users are clicking in spam, and in fact, the statistical model of a spam filter will change and it will adapt. So, I mean, that's how that would work. Okay. I'll just say a little bit about what people do uh, here. It's really quite, it, it's actually, in some ways, it's so obvious that no one would imagine any, doing anything else. So here it is. It's rolling horizon optimization. And the way that works is you make predictions for the future, then you use optimization to do a plan of action. So at 2 a.m., you guess this is what the power requirements, this is what the demand, electricity demand in Melbourne, actually it's by little districts, but forget, you know, let's pretend it's just aggregated. You can say this is what it's gonna look like tomorrow. And then what happens is, you know, at, at 10 a.m. tomorrow, you'll know more about the weather. You'll make better predictions and you'll be able to better predict the actual demand. Right? And so you'll update all these things. <coughs> so you simply replan when new stuff comes. And this is kind of obvious. In fact, I know the person who worked on revenue management for guru in the field. And I said, what do you call it when you do this? Because this has lots of names. And he looked at me and he said, uh, he said, what do we call this? He said, well, we call that revenue management. <laughs> oh, okay. So in other words, they just don't even question that there'd be any other way to do this. So, and I'll just show you a quick example. And, and there is one important point about the example. It turns out, this is the dirty secret of this. It turns out, when you're re-optimizing based on new information, it turns out that's very robust and your predictions don't have to be very good. Um, I mean, don't, this is kind of a secret in the field, but I'm revealing it to you, right? It's a dirty, that's what control is, right? It turns out you can make some pretty crappy predictions but as long as you're sort of updating it in the right way, then it's actually going to all balance out and work really well. That's, that's what people call control. Um, so here's an example where you know, you're, this is a generator you're scheduling. The blue is the actual demand. This is the future. This is right now. And what happens here is the green is the prediction of the future demand. Well, you can't predict there's going to be some big spike there. So, but you do get the trend about right. Right? So the trend, you get the trend right, and that means you've, you've already told a bunch of generators, start ramping up now. And they're already ramping up. 
Yeah, but they don't know. They don't know these details. Uh, but what happens is it turns out if you, as long as you, if you just did this once and quit, it would be a disaster. Clearly, it would be a disaster. Look what would happen here. You'd be, you'd be way under in meeting demand. But it turns out if you roll this like this and re-optimize, it actually works really well. And this is actually how a lot of things work, right? Now I'm going to wrap up. And there's a couple things I want to talk about. Um, so the first is, and this comes back actually to the very beginning, well, to maximum. So my claim is there's something like it's a new applied math is, is emerging, or really has emerged. Uh, by the way, if you say applied math, it actually has a, me I mean, it has a meaning. It means kind of classical applied math. It's the mathematics of physics. You know, like that, that's, what, that's, the, that's what you should think about. People who work on, uh, you know, uh, pre you know, predicting fluid flow or something like that. I mean, this is very important stuff. That's classical applied mathematics. This is not that. This is something different. So it's like a new form. And the idea is it involves things like model fitting from data, often statistically motivated. It assumes from the beginning you're going to use an algorithmic and computationally method. Uh, method. You know, this is not you know, fiddling with little formulas on a chalkboard, right? It's not that kind of thing. Um, and this is kind of the core of this new applied math. That, that's my claim. Um, by the way, it is done in tons of departments. Uh, computer science. You even argue, I'd even argue that two thirds of computer science is this new applied math. EE, electrical engineering. Half of it is this new applied math. Um, statistics, all of it. Operations research, most of it. Okay. Oh, by the way, there's something missing from this list. Anybody notice a, 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 a glaring department missing there? <laughs> Math. That's right. right. Yeah. So as far as I can tell, the only people who really don't know about this new trend are people in math. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the exception. That's, the exception. that's the exception. I'm just I'm speaking statistically now. You can have a counterexample. So, so actually, that's why I'm so happy to be here, because I've been proved wrong. Uh, so, so uh, but let's, let's see, how, should, how can I put this delegate? It is being recorded, so I have to well, Let's just say, uh, the number of mathematicians I know are not aware of the things I talked about today. Let's just leave, and I'll just leave it that Okay. Um, so, the idea is this is applied in tons of different areas. I just gave you a hint of a couple of them, but it goes way beyond the ones I told you about. Uh, oh, by the way, and don't if you talk, if you know people who do these things, it's quite likely that they wouldn't even they don't know that there's a bigger picture that they often into. I mean, some people do, but most don't. Um, and if I was talking to about I really think what it does is people blabber on and on about smart systems and smart this, and you know you have a smart grid and all that kind of stuff. That's just idle talk. What actually makes things smart is this kind of stuff, right? Is you look at it and you go, whoa, why did that generator start ramping the power up? The demand hasn't gone up and because it knows or it's a model is predicted that in 30 minutes the demand is going to go up, okay? Because the weather's going to change, you know? So, I mean, you don't see it a lot, but uh, this is what it is. Okay. One question is, why, why now? And my claim is actually things have really changed. Okay. It's not, you know, it's not 19, it's not 19th century, it's not 1960 anymore. What's happened is you have the ability to collect, store, and move massive amounts of data. Okay, so that's that's new. Um, you have cheap, powerful computing. And yes, some of us work on new algorithms, right? Uh, now of course, by the way, most people who do this would like to think that this is what's powered all of this. And this is, it's not true, actually. The dirty <laughs> secret is those of us who work on algorithms. Turns out, I'll tell you really yours. We don't do anything. We just sit around, pretend to work, and the people who worked on computer systems will, will, you know, Moore's Law, they'll be just wait 18 months, they'll be double in power. And then we'll say, look, this thing now runs twice as fast. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll attribute it to the algorithm we just published a paper on. So if you're in these fields, I actually recommend this strongly. So, okay. um, so what's about, I mean, you know, this is hardly a new idea. Here's Van Bush Bush, you know, the, the the grandfather of sort of the modern uh, research at universities, uh, you know, talking about, you know, <laughs> we have cheap, complex devices of great reliability. This is in the forties, right? So these are not new ideas by any means. And I'll just finish up with one last thing, which is where is it going? And so these things are already here. They're all around you. You experience them. You are uh, you're part of them. 
you're being tracked. Uh, every search you make, every, I mean, all sorts of creepy stuff is happening. Every time you make a, you use a credit card, and it turns out later it wasn't fraud. Oh, but by the way, if you do commit credit card fraud, also, you are, uh, you are, your data is going into something, it goes to a giant data center, and it will tweak little parameters that are used to do fraud detection, okay? So, um, personalized advertising, that's sort of happening now. Uh, and there are a lot of others, good and bad. Actually, a bunch of them are obviously bad. So, you know, the NSA watching you and things like that. Um, it's pretty creepy, but the, the technology is neutral, and it, there certainly is the possibility, and I think some good has been done. I mean, engines running a factor of two or three cleaner, that's a good thing. And you could probably name a couple of other good things. I can't think of them. No, I'm joking. Um, yeah, so, you know, what, what's a world, because this is happening, right? So this is not a, it's not a hypothetical question. It's, it's actually already here, and it's happened. And the question is, what's it going to look like? And actually, I don't know. So, but you might as well think about it and get used to it, because it's here, and then you're, this is just the tip of the iceberg. So, OK, so I'm, I'm going to quit here. And I'll be very happy to answer questions and things like that. So uh, if your conjecture is that optimization will put smarts into systems, mm -hmm. why not call it artificial intelligence? You could, and people do. You could, and people do. And I, I, I wouldn't dispute it. So, so people do do that. I mean, the problem is it's like applied math. It actually, unfortunately, it means something, and it's not what we want it to mean. And AI has a lot of baggage with it. So, so. Right. Any other questions? We have some people here from the finance industry, and I'm sure they're wondering what I'm wondering, which is, uh, you mentioned you're a student, who won't tell you the name of the fund, um, but did you invest your own money in your student's work? No. Are you that confident? <laughs> no. 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 In fact, when you saw that, I think you'd think anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any final questions? Yes. Hey, you, because your systems tend to think about, like, um, miss or error or this um, classification as like um, a matter of fact and yeah. you, you, you take the benefit as like all our way yeah. then in, in, in medicine or biology people take all the negative very seriously yes they do yeah so, so you do oh no, no, this, this can be dealt with in fact it's very important to deal with this correctly right because we didn't talk about it but they're all I mean here's an example of a smart system and stuff going on in like radiation oncology Right? Or for that matter, uh, robotic surgery. So that, these are smart systems. They are embedded optimization. But the, there, what happens when it's wrong or it fails is very bad. Right? So yeah, this stuff has to be taken very, very seriously. Uh, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't, uh, you, should, you should simply blanket not use it. Right? It means you have to think about it very carefully. And by the way, sometimes the answer is going to be this. <coughs> the risks are not worth the benefit. So that will sometimes be the answer. Uh, but that's a very good point. I didn't talk about it here. But yes, there are cases where when it fails, it, it, the results are very bad. Yes? You haven't talked about vulnerability. Mm -hmm. All these smart systems are out there. How vulnerable are some of them to this attack? Oh, uh, uh, quite. Yes, so that's, a, that's another issue, right? That when I talked about models going bad, um, you know, or, or a lot of the other times I talked about uh, statistical models. Now, statistical models are really, they're kind of benign. It just means you don't know what it is. It could be kind of in this range, right? But the, you, you can turn that up, and you just turn a knob, uh, to turn the knob all the way off on one side, your model is perfect, and your predictions are perfect. You turn it up a little bit, and you get statistical models, which is, it's kind of right, but it could be, it, could, it can actually end up in your favor, right? You keep turning that, that's the evil knob, by the way. Um, you turn the evil knob all the way up, and you have something like game theory or uh, actually an adversary. That's someone who can actually mess with the outcome, who is actively trying to do the opposite of what you want to do, right? And so, now that, that's a whole other area of, of, of this, but it's actually very closely related um, to this. But anyway, so, that's, so the answer is that there are people who study those things.
um, this game theory and stuff like that, and I would consider it an extension. But yes, these things are quite vulnerable to, uh, or can be, and people should be thinking about that. Yeah? I was interested in your comment about this sort of stuff not happening in, in mathematics departments. Um, I'd suggest yes. that that's probably true in the United States, because the United States mathematics means what we would call pure mathematics here in Australia. That's exactly correct. And I'm, actually, I'm, I'm glad you, uh, you corrected that. Yeah, um, because, you know, the sort of, uh, it's very, we try to be much more inclusive of, of um, sort of application now. That's, that is fantastic. And actually, that, that's why this is so great. Uh, that's why it's great to do that, because there's incredibly exciting things happening in math if you don't define it extremely narrowly to be extremely pure mathematics, like some universities on the West Coast. You know. Anyway, so, so <laughs> yeah. But no, you're exactly right that, that uh, I think the mathematics departments that are more inclusive and understand that statistics and embrace statistics, computation, algorithmic approaches, modeling, and applications like this, like Maxima, I think are positioned really well for the next couple of decades. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes? There's also uh, now that we see um, possibly new things of computation coming up, quantum computation. And yeah. This is all, essentially, it's also about optimization. Mm -hmm. and do you have any thoughts about where this is going to lead us? Um, well, uh, quantum computation, I don't know. I know people who work on this. Uh, it, I mean, again, this is just from my view. I, I know very little about it. It seems a little bit like fusion. It's always, it's always super duper interesting, super smart people working on it, and it always seems like it's about 20 years away from yeah. Yeah. Now, by the way, every now and then, one of these things, there's some giant breakthrough, and we'll all be using quantum computers. But. So, if, actually, I'll, if quantum computers come through, I will embrace them, and we'll be happy to do, that will solve really big optimization problems then when they come through. But I'm not holding my breath. <laughs> uh, probably get, uh, one more from Mark. Yes. <laughs> Talked about good applications and bad applications, the equal ones. What about algorithmic trading? How do you classify that? Uh, well, I just differ, well, okay. I, I would say it's both, it, and it depends on some fine distinctions, right? The traditional way to make money is to have an unfair advantage. That, that is the tradition, as, as you know, I assume you're in finance. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, but, you know, that's the traditional way to do that, and so you can do that many ways. Um, well, you could have insider information, that's a traditional method, and another method would be to pay your lobbyists to pass laws in the United States that would allow ridiculous things like it would allow you to look at the book before everybody else, okay? <laughs> so not that anything that ridiculous would ever happen. Oh, oops, it has. Um, so these are the traditional ways to make money, right? And so in, in those cases, I would have to say that's evil. Uh, that first, this is my personal, that's not a mathematical statement, that's my personal statement. Um, I think in other cases, it's actually, if it's actually done in the right way, it is good. I mean, this, this idea that people talk about providing liquidity and stuff like that, if people really are having equal footing and equal information, and everyone's trading, I think actually, that actually is good. Please join me in thanking Stephen. In fact, tomorrow we have summer entry from the US Naval Academy coming to talk to us about the maths involved in matching kidney donors to transplant recipients. Um, that's tomorrow at 3 o'clock if anyone's interested in the maths building. Uh, uh, thank you.